all told, it was roughly 50 people that we ended up, that our helicopter crews ended up pulling out that evening. And the account of the conditions down there, uh, as far as an aviator goes, were some of the worst that I've ever heard of. I was getting bumped around up there as it was, but not nearly like these guys were flying into basically hurricane force winds that were being created not only by the north wind, but by the fire itself. Hello, and thank you for joining me for episode 37 of the Aviation News Talk podcast for a Newsmakers edition, where we talk to people who are making the news. And there's been no greater news for the past week than the Northern California wildfires, which collectively are the deadliest fires in state history, having claimed 41 lives and destroying a record 5,700 structures. In a moment, we'll be sitting down with Jan Sears, a California Highway Patrol or CHP officer and pilot, and we'll talk about how he discovered and reported the fire and how CHP officers immediately began rescuing people who were trapped by the fires. So get ready because this Newsmakers edition starts now. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about the very best of general aviation and the people in our industry. I'm Max Truscott, and if you're new to the show, we have a weekly show that shares pilot safety tips and general aviation news from around the world. And last week's episode, we released the results of our flight planning survey and shared how listeners go about planning longer trips. So if you missed it, check out episode 36. But today is one of our Newsmakers episodes where we interview movers and shakers in the aviation industry. And this past weekend, the governor of California called the Northern California wildfires, quote, one of the greatest tragedies California has ever faced. And even as we sit here recording this today, nine days after the fire started, over 11,000 firefighters are still on the front lines fighting these fires. You've probably seen news reports showing some of the dozens of air tankers and helicopters that are fighting the fires, but most people are unaware that the California Highway Patrol runs one of the largest law enforcement aviation operations in the country, both in number of aircraft and hours flown. And those aircraft, flown by CHP officer pilots, have been heavily involved in fire-related activities. Earlier today, I talked with Jan Sears, and he was the first pilot to spot the fires from the air while flying a routine patrol for CHP. Now let me tell you a little bit about Jan Sears. Jan grew up here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and at age 10 started taking flying lessons from a CFI friend who he also describes as a mentor. Jan soloed at the Oakland airport at age 16, and he finished his private while spending a year at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona. His initial career plan was to fly jets in the military, but just three weeks into basic training, an asthma attack led to an honorable discharge and left Jan wondering what he would do next. Steps along the way to his current job included working as an EMT in San Francisco for three years, attending paramedic school, and then working in Oakland as a paramedic for over 10 years, and finally joining CHP as a patrol officer at age 31. Well, Jan, I'd like to officially welcome you to the Aviation News Talk podcast. We're really excited to have you here today. Thanks, Max. It's uh, great to be here. I really appreciate the uh, the offer. Well, so a lot of listeners outside of California and around the world probably don't know Northern California as well as you and I. So for those people, start by telling us a little bit about the airport that you fly out of for CHP and then where it's located relative to San Francisco, the current fires, and then maybe talk a little bit about the terrain up in the fire region. Yeah, you bet. So I'm based currently at the uh, Napa County Airport. The California Highway Patrol has eight air operation bases throughout the state. And uh, the one that handles this region just happens to be based at the Napa County Airport, which uh, on a normal day is uh, outstanding. The views of the vineyards and views of the surrounding hills. To the east, we've got hills that rise to about 2,000 to 2,500 feet. To the west, you've got a number of different ranges that are uh, between 1,500 and 1,000 feet, and then you've got the ocean. Um, You know, as the crow flies, it takes us about 20 minutes to reach the ocean, and uh, we're about 20 nautical miles north of of San Francisco's airport. So a very, um, very nice uh, location to be based out of. Geographically, it's beautiful, and it's not the largest um, division in the state. Uh, Northern Division has that 
opportunity just because of the square miles that they have to cover. But we uh, we abut up to uh, that division, which is um, takes us all the way up to Cloverdale as far south as um, just south of San Jose and east to uh, Davis and Tracy. So a fairly, fairly good sized piece of uh, real estate that we manage. Um, and we cover that with uh, two aircrafts, uh, two airplanes and two helicopters. So yeah, super, super cool job. Well, so Jan, tell us about the airplanes that you're flying, how it's equipped, and then tell us a little bit about your flying partner and what he does when you're flying on a normal day. Yeah, so for the past 15 or 17 years, actually, we were operating the Cessna 206, which uh, half the state still has. At this point, uh, we've decided to switch aircraft, and we're currently flying a uh, Gips Aero GA-8, which is a Australian uh, built aircraft. There's only about 250 of them in the world. They were originally designed for outback flying, taking you know pieces of equipment, medical supplies, Foster's logger, whatever whatever fits in the door, to a very you know remote location. So it has you know, short takeoff and landing capabilities, and it's not the fastest machine in the world, but size wise, it's kind of in between a. Uh, Cessna 206 stationaire and a caravan. So it kind of uh, melds in that uh, particular fashion. It's probably the most well-equipped aircraft I've ever flown as far as avionics go. We have a, a Garmin G500 accompanied by a GTN 750 and 650 along with two iPads and four flight. Um, I feel like I've definitely reached the 21st century since we came from uh, steam gauges and the uh, KLN 94 in the old aircraft. So it was a, a major leap in technology as far as, as far as the cockpit goes. And in the aft compartment uh, resides the, the most important component of this aircraft, which is my partner, which changes on a day-to-day basis. I primarily fly, my, uh, my primary partner is uh, Todd Labity and Russ Vo. Those are the two that fly on the ship that I fly, which is the afternoon shift. And their primary function is to operate the uh, their, what we call sensor operators. So we have a, a camera that is actually about a third the price of the aircraft that is mounted in the belly of the camera of the of the aircraft. And that a camera is uh, retractable. So when we're when it's not in use, it's folded up in the center of the belly. And when we uh, want to use it, we retract it out. And out comes a camera that from, you know, half a mile up, we can read a license plate from 5,500 feet at night when we're, you know, just a droning, you know, quiet aircraft. We can uh, view backyards and look for bad guys and look for vehicles and lost people. And that's primarily what we do back there. I'm essentially the limousine driver and the guy in the back is telling me where we need to go as he monitors over, uh, we've got seven radios going, law enforcement, fire, and ambulance radios that are constantly being monitored. So most of what we do, uh, rather than being dispatched to calls, which we do as well, but a lot of what we do is very proactive. So by listening to certain agencies, we'll hear a call come out, we'll respond to that location, and by the direction of my flight officer in the back, and uh, we'll go and see what kind of assistance we can render. And what a great job you guys do. I was lucky enough to fly with one of your crews out of uh, Auburn about uh, six years ago for an article that I wrote. And it was kind of fun watching as they were flying over Sacramento and how they were assisting the units on the ground. So let's go back about a week to Sunday when the fire started, October the 8th, 2017. How did that day start for you? And what were your thoughts about what that day was going to be like? Yeah, I mean it. Uh, it started at 1400 hours, just like my sh- my ship runs from 1400 to midnight. And my partner Todd Labity and I, you know, arrived and pre-flighted our aircraft and just got ready to go for the day. And we'd gone out. You know, I think we left around you know three in the afternoon, kind of like we always do, do a patrol flight, then came back. We kind of uh, just to give you an idea of how day goes. It's usually um, about half of our shift is spent in the air the other half on the ground waiting, available to respond if necessary. If if not, we're just kind of there and ready. It would be kind of uh, fiscally uh, irresponsible if we flew 10 hours out of our 10-hour shift. So not to mention the aircraft would be in maintenance every three days. So we try to, to meter the time accordingly. But when 
large calls come out that require us to spend as much time as possible over them, that's that's when that all goes out the window. So this particular day, we um, were just out kind of on our routine patrol right before um, you know the big incident occurred. So we were just making our way home. And did you have any idea that, you know, this was going to be a, a bad time for fires? And were you kind of thinking about them anyway when you were out flying? One of the things that, that I do up front that, you know, the flight officer has a view of the camera and a little bit of a view out of the side of the aircraft, but he spends most of his time looking at the dual monitors that are in the back. So I have the full, you know, almost 210 degree view up front because the Gips is a lot like a helicopter as far as view goes. It's very, um, very well laid out. So I'm able to see, and, you know, obviously when I'm looking and seeing and avoiding other aircraft, I'm also just kind of looking, I'm looking on the ground for speeding cars or things that look out of the ordinary accidents. And then I, um, you know, often will just focus out into the distance. And on this particular night, that's when I picked up on something that did not look right uh, north of the Napa airport. So. And what was it that uh, you first saw and what did you do? Yeah. Yeah. So. It looked to me like um, just a little flicker, very faint, um, but just in a very dark portion of um, what I came to find out was Atlas Peak. So I told my fly officer in the back, I said, hey, I, I'm seeing a light up here. You know, it could just be, you know, somebody at a winery having a party and just, you know, because they're very often in these large um, mansions that are up on those hills. Sometimes they have large gatherings, lots of light. You know, it's it's a Sunday night, but you know, who knows? So, but I said, you know, let's just go take a look. And it was, you know, only a five minute flight. And as we approached, the flicker began to grow in size greatly as I got closer and closer. And then I immediately realized that we were dealing with a fire and it was growing so quickly that uh, I had my flight officer bring up Napa County Fire's radio and with the use of the camera pointed at the fire, we could get the exact latitude, longitude, cross streets um, where we could see the origin of the fire. And we started telling them that uh, they need to get resources up there as quickly as possible because that night, one of the one of the unusual things is so we had the north wind, uh, what I call the wicked north wind. I and mean, that usually kicks up a few times a year when we get the combination of a high and a low that are close enough to each other that they bicycle wheel off one another and create really high winds out of the north. And this particular night, across the mountaintops in that region, winds were forecast to be in a 50 miles an hour gusting to 70. So I kind of knew that we were dealing with that because I departed from Napa and the winds, surface winds were well out of the north, straight down 3-6 left, but 20 knots, which is definitely not the normal situation. So. I alerted the fire department, at least let them know that you had high wind conditions and a fire that, you know, when we arrived overhead, looked to me to, to be about 10 acres. But after two or three orbits, I was starting to think that it was closer to 100 <laughs> and then rapidly starting to overtake many structures and homes that were on the hillside. You know, mind you, this is, you know, 2200 hours local at night. People are bedding down for the evening probably this is not anything that's on their mind. And so I, I started calling anybody and everybody. Our helicopter happened to be just launching out of the Oakland airport after refueling and heard me talking to Napa County Fire. And I, I got them on our, what we call our Victor frequency and said, you, you need to head this way because I think we're going to be not fighting a fire. I think we're going to be performing rescue operations um, late into the evening. It just I could see by the rate of growth that this was not something that the ground crews were going to be able to get a handle on. It was more of, we need to get the people out of their homes so that we don't have loss of life. So that's, uh, that's how things began. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so uh, you're talking about rescuing people, I, I guess within the next few hours, uh, you and the helicopter and others were involved in a lot of rescues. Tell us about the, the rescues that night. Yeah. Um, the helicopter, uh, the crew of Whitney Lowe and Pete Gavitt on our helicopter H-32 began. They just they came in, started seeing sort of where the edge of the fire was, determined where they could uh, find a landing zone, and just started listening for addresses because at that time the fire department was starting to receive calls from individuals saying basically that they're they're tra trapped. 
they would throw an address out. We have an entrapment at this address. So with the availability of the Churchill mapping system that we use in the aircraft, uh, you can type in the address and the camera will actually point exactly to that address and give a heading to the pilot so that he can sort of maneuver the aircraft over toward that direction. And at that point, they had to kind of make the call, you know, is the address in the fire already or is it on the outskirts of the fire? And so there was a lot of individual judgment calls that took place with each address that that crew ended up going into. By the end of the evening, that that first probably six hours of the fire, they ended up pulling 26 individuals out and five dogs or cats. And we ended up dragging in another helicopter from a adjoining division, Northern Division, which is out of Reading, but they happened to be on the Southern portion of their division, heard me on our Victor frequency and asked that they, we needed help. And we went through channels, got permission for them to leave division and come down, and they ended up extricating approximately 20 people themselves. So all told, it was roughly 50 people that we ended up, that our helicopter crews ended up pulling out that evening. And the account of the conditions down there, uh, as far as an aviator goes, were some of the worst that I've ever heard of. I was getting bumped around up there as it was, but not nearly like these guys were flying into basically hurricane force winds that were being created not only by the north wind, but by the fire itself, which, you know, fire, you know, the, the, the term firestorm was indefinitely in play at this point. And they were, you know, dealing with up and down drafts, 20 to 50 feet and massive headwinds along with tailwinds that I heard, I overheard them discussing it. We, they had a ground speed at one point when they left the fire to drop someone off of almost 210 knots. So they were getting, you know, tailwinds uh, anywhere 70, 80 miles an hour and upwards of that uh, in addition to the turbulence. So they were dealing with some very horrendous conditions to pull these people out. And it was definitely a, uh, a risk versus gain scenario. And they were picking and choosing as they went through each address to, to see who they were going to be able to help and who they were not. So it was, you know, we were basically the eye above that kind of giving them an idea of the boundary of the fire, how the winds were behaving, at least for us, watching the smoke pattern, which um, ultimately ended up uh, flowing directly into the Napa airport and, and making the airport IFR after, uh, after a few hours, just by the sheer volume of smoke that was being uh, deposited down there. So, yeah, it was... Uh, it was a uh, it was a little frustrating, you know, having been on the helicopter and been a flight officer and knowing knowing what that job entails, and you're able to land and get out and grab people, put them in, and leave. And meanwhile, I'm at you know 9,000 feet in light to moderate turbulence, you know, making orbits and making calls, you know, knowing that you know my place here is I, I got to be as verbal as I can on the radio and put out as much information that's helpful to the guys on the ground and our helicopter crews so that as many people as possible could be saved. So that's, that's kind of was, was my story for the, uh, the six hours of flight time that we ended up flying between when the fire started uh, somewhere close to 2,200 hours and seven o'clock in the morning. We, we did at one point try to go to Vacaville to pick up a battalion chief to bring him back so that he could kind of get a size up of what they were dealing with. So we had a fire you know, expert with us, but I, uh, I looked at the winds in Vacaville and they were, you know, you got runway two zero and you got runway two there and the winds were three, four, zero at, at three, five gusting to four, seven. So well outside the crossing component of the aircraft. And yes, yeah, so we, we had to, we had to make a lot of uh, judgment calls on our own. And once I decided to, that I needed to go back and get some fuel at Napa, I started my descent down and I hit, possibly some of the worst turbulence I've ever flown in in my life. I mean, it was probably moderate to severe with the yoke locked to lock, uh, nearly out of control for a period of time. And I just kept, uh, I stopped my descent. I proceeded as far south from the hills as I could because this area is, is very hilly. So the, the combination of, you know, massive surface winds and uh, the fire, you know, the heat coming off of that fire, was putting out some turbulence like I'd never been involved in before. So 
Uh, we made it back to the airport in one piece. I think I had a ground speed of 30 knots on touchdown on runway 36 left because the winds were so gusty out of the north. So it was quite a handful to get uh, get the plane back. So after that, I decided that we might be better off getting in a car and heading into town and seeing what, what help we can be on the ground. And we ended up spending the next four hours uh, knocking door to door, getting people to evacuate. We ended up evacuating our, our neighboring, uh, the hangar that neighbors our hangar. Family owns a vineyard, uh, Paul Mall's Vineyard, off of one of the roads in the adjacent to Monticello Road. And we got them uh, evacuated, got a number of other people to uh, that didn't really even know what was going on. You know, you knock on their door at, you know, one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and uh, who's the stranger at the door? And it's, uh, you know, a couple of guys wearing guns and badges saying it's time to leave. So. Hopefully we made a difference there. We did put a fire out uh, ourselves with a fire extinguisher. So, you know, just kind of random things that we came across, you know, and as the night progressed, uh, we came back to the office at about six in the morning and stood by. Um, Normally our shift ends at midnight, but we stayed overtime by necessity more than anything. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was one of those nights that I will never forget in my career. You know, I've been, I've been in the highway patrol now for 17 years. And aside from maybe my deployment to Hurricane Katrina, um, this will be one of the most memorable, you know, not in the best way always, but uh, one of the most memorable um, weeks of my career. Yeah, that's that's an amazing story. And of course, the stories continue. We're sitting here now about, uh, what, nine days after the fires uh, first started and they're still uh, still battling yeah. them out there. So you said you're up at around uh, 9,000 feet and trying to be as verbal as possible and pass along as much information as possible. Who were you talking to and, and what kind of coordination were you doing with the helicopters? Yeah, so primarily my conversations were with uh, Napa County Fire. My partner in the back was talking to the Napa County Sheriff's Department and our CHP. So he had two frequencies to handle himself. And so I took one of those frequencies. At this point, you know, a lot of times these fires occur, a temporary, a temporary flight restriction will be placed over the fire. But Cal Fire had not gotten to that point yet. This fire started at night. There wasn't going to be any. Um, they, Cal Fire does no nighttime uh, aerial firefighting, so it was really it was really left kind of in our hands to um, coordinate as much as we could. Try to give really the biggest thing was these roads were rapidly becoming blocked, and and that Atlas Peak is one of those areas that kind of has a one way in, one way out kind of a scenario. And uh, I was trying as much as possible to try to just differentiate the roads that were passable versus the ones that were not um, by using the, our high-powered camera. The beauty of having forward, forward-looking forward infrared is that it cuts through smoke. So the smoke you know, that completely obstructs you when you're looking at the window or trying to use a standard video camera, uh, you turn it to infrared and you would think that there was no smoke there. The visibility becomes very good. It's very similar to wearing night vision goggles. You just sort of kind of cuts through that haze and you're able to um, to see things that otherwise you wouldn't. So that's where we spent most of our time. I didn't, um, you know, air traffic control at the Napa airport closes at 20 hundred local time. So they were already closed. I didn't notify Oakland Center that it's kind of their airspace right there bordering with uh, Travis approach. I didn't get a chance to notify them just because I was too inundated with trying to really focus on what was going on below me. So that's that's really where um, the bulk of the time was spent. And, you know, coordinating, you know, we have the same Victor frequency at our office. So we had one uh, of our fly officer paramedics, Matt Gutierrez, was down in the office and he was kind of manning the phone and, you know, advising the chief and, and everybody that needed to be notified what was going on and getting as many permissions as we could to get uh, outside aircraft to come in. Uh, but those two, the two helicopters, the one from Northern Division, which is H-16, and, and our helicopter, H-32, spent the, the following 12 to 48 hours still affecting some rescues occasionally. Really, the core of the rescues occurred kind of in that from 2200 to about to about 7 in the morning within the major fire zone. 
you know the other the other thing that was going on that that I hadn't mentioned is the uh, the Tubbs fire, which is the fire that overwhelmed Santa Rosa. That fire was occurring at the same time, most likely caused by high winds as well. And so a lot of these fire resources were already being used um, to fight this fire up north. So, you know, when the request came in from the initial CAL FIRE battalion chief, he requested, you know, 100 units and he was only able to get 50 because those resources were being spread thin up north. Cap it all off, another fire started about uh, six miles to the west um, at the probably within an hour of this fire starting and not in the, the path of ember. So it's a completely unassociated, but that was near highway 121 in Carneros. So that fire burned a huge swath of hillside in addition to uh, causing some evacuations down in the uh, lowlands adjacent to uh, Devlin road and kind of down by, um, down by the Napa river. So yeah, just, <laughs> it was, it was chaos, you know, and you know, we're, we're obviously we're, we're trained as police officers to deal with emergency scenes like this. It's a little bit different when you're operating an aircraft simultaneously while trying to direct all of this, while trying to accommodate your flight officer in the back where he needs to orbit to look at things. Cause yeah, it's just a, it was a, and it's one of those things that you, you kind of look back on it and um, you know, time, there was a little, so much going on that you don't realize exactly how much you are doing until you stop for a moment and kind of rethink uh, back through everything like I'm doing now. It's kind of the catharsis of being able to uh, to see how it all went. I think really the only thing I wish I had done was maybe get lower and put our PA on and turn our siren on and make as much noise as possible. So, you know, people might just, you know, what's all the racket? you know, look out the window and go, oh, time to leave. But I was, uh, you know, operationally, I was operating high due to the high turbulence and high winds. And really my focus was on those communications with uh, both our helicopters and, and the fire crews on the ground. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that uh, both you and your first officer there were incredibly busy trying to deal with, with all the chaos. Were you involved uh, in some way with uh, the first rescue that we've heard a little bit about with a family that uh, wasn't able to all get on the helicopter? You know, yeah, we were, um, I knew they were down there. You know, we, we would see the helicopter come in, come out, but we were really doing two different things. You know, I would you know, an address would come out for um, entrapment. We would train the camera over there. I would, um, you know, put out whether it was on fire or not. And, you know, they were either engaged in a rescue or engaged in dropping off people that they had picked up. So really we were, um, uh, occasionally I would talk to him on our Victor frequency, but they were so busy and we were, you know, obviously busy as well that, we were sort of operating, um, you know, in the same fire, but separately. So it was a kind of a unique, kind of a unique scenario because normally we would be very heavily coordinated, but you know, a lot of what they were flying into from the angles of, of my orbits, they were literally going underneath between the hillside and the smoke. So they were, they would disappear underneath this bank of smoke, um, you know, probably, you know, anywhere from 50 to a hundred feet AGL and the affecting rescues in some of the most miserable conditions possible. So the yeah, comms were, were limited. You know, I would, I would see him pop out and I'd, I'd go, Hey, how's your fuel status? Are you guys doing all right? Do you need a crew change? That kind of thing. And so, you know, they did a, a number of hot refuels, which we only do in emergency situations. So, and you know, the, the only, the real nice thing is that the airport was literally six miles from this fire, you know, so we were, they were able to land, refuel, and be back in you know under 10 minutes, which you can't say for most fires. <laughs> you know, most of the time they're very isolated, or an airport is several miles away. But the co-location with our office and the incident really uh, kind of played in favor for for both of us. Yeah, that is really lucky on the one hand that it was close by, but unlucky in that obviously it's a populated area yeah. uh, close to the close to the fire. Well, tell us about the ensuing yeah. uh, you know week. How have your activities changed over the last week? What what have you and CHP been doing since the, uh, the very beginning of the fire? 
So the day after, um, the next day, we kind of proactively just went out on, on fire patrol, sort of. <laughs> we did take um, a CAL FIRE fire behaviorist. I didn't even know there was such a thing, but um, so they're, they're trained in, you know, how a fire responds and reacts to the environment as far as winds, weather, temperature, et cetera. And we took him up and flew around the entire perimeter of the Atlas Peak Fire, which by that time had grown. Um, it had gone not only toward the, the south and west, but it had also started north and east against uh, the winds that were coming out of the northeast that night had died down. So basically fire just heads toward fuel at that point. So it was kind of fueling itself and heading sort of up the ridge line and then down the backside of the ridge line. And uh, I don't know how many of the listeners are familiar with Lake Berryessa, but kind of in a direction. If you drew a line from the Napa airport to Lake Berryessa, it was kind of the route that the northeastern portion of the fire was taking. And and to my knowledge, uh, right now, nine days later, that portion of the fire is still active. The southern portions of the fire have been put out. Uh, that being said, the fire that's above Glen Ellen and south of Santa Rosa, as of last night, had, you know, 50 to 100 foot flames. So, and that's burning in kind of a an unpopulated portion of the ridgeline between Napa Valley and Sonoma Valley. But a number of um, structures are still uh, threatened. We did some dignitary flying. We flew a senator around so that he could get an idea of, you know, the breadth of the destruction uh, that all, you know, because in total, I think they categorized these as five separate fires, but they affected, you know, Napa, Sonoma, and uh, Solano counties. Uh, kind of get a breadth of the size of the fire so that we could get uh, resources from, from the federal government, which were shortly after granted by President Trump and Governor Brown. So, and, uh, you know, on top of that, I'm just, I'm a little more vigilant looking out the window, you know, especially at, at times of darkness when you can really see these things. Um, we got called last night down to San Jose to look at a fire that was, that was east of the San Jose airport, kind of right, I'd say about four miles from Reed Hillview up on the ridge and from the bay bridge i could see the flicker because i'm kind of attuned to it now and you know we trained the camera down there and found it and we let san jose fire know that we had the location and they went out there and they snuffed that one out before it got big so but they had actually called our office i guess i guess they're catching wind that we we not only look for bad guys but we look for fires so as a pilot you're forever vigilant anyway for anything that's, you know, of a threat to you or your, or your passengers. But I'm also, you know, trained as a, as a, you know, an officer for the CHP and I've been a paramedic for longer than I've been doing anything else. So those things keep me extra vigilant, not only uh, taking care of myself, but others, others that uh, could potentially be in danger. So yeah, the rest of the week has been really just kind of watching out to make sure that the existing fires don't expand. And we really lucked out with the wind. You know, that north wind uh, died off, the low moved east, and the high moved north. And uh, we just sort of, it lost its energy, which really kind of killed it off. We had one officer at the office who was evacuated. He just went back to his house yesterday. Um, His house was about 200 feet from catching fire. They had fire crews up there that we had helped get up into this neighborhood of 180 houses in Circle Oaks, which is on the way to Lake Berryessa. So they fought that fire based on some advice that we gave them. And myself and another pilot, our neighborhood was under evacuation watch for five days because the fire got within three miles of our home. So I was packed by the door and ready to go in addition to going in to work to fly. So, (laughs) and meanwhile, my wife is at flight attendant school for sky west in salt lake city she's in you know she was halfway through when the fire started and now in her last week but so here we are evacuating our house and my wife is trying to focus on you know finishing flight attendant school back there and so it's been it's been an interesting week to say the least i'm you know i'm really my my heart goes out to to the families that 
were affected by this. I mean, we're talking, you know, 5,000 plus homes, 40 plus lives lost with 200 plus people still in the missing category, which, you know, we're all hoping are just people whose cell phones aren't working or don't have email access, but it, it sort of, you start to, uh, you start to think the worst when this amount of time has gone by and those people have not made contact with loved ones yet. And our guys on the ground, the first responders, you know, the CHP officers have been on 12 hour shifts with days off canceled since this started in Napa, Sonoma and Solano counties. So they've been working tirelessly. Cal Fire and all of the other fire departments, not only in the Bay Area, but we're talking state and nationwide because we pulled in resources, federal resources from all over. I mean, it has been such a multifaceted group of people. It's just amazing that they've been able to, to beat this thing down. Kudos to their work. You know, we're, we're just one piece in this gigantic puzzle that was able to uh, hopefully make a small difference. And that's, that's, all we, that's all we aim to do when we go to work every day is make, make a small difference you know, because that's that's what we do. Well, and we're really grateful that you and your colleagues are making what I think is a huge difference. Tell me for a few minutes, what's a more normal day like with uh, you know for you? I think a lot of listeners probably think, oh, they're just out there catching speeders from the air, but that's actually a pretty low priority mission for you, isn't it? Yeah, um, you know, when the when the air operations program was first conceived back in the '60s, the idea was to do speed enforcement with an aircraft in addition to backing up our guys on the ground. It has morphed into much larger things. The advent of these high-powered um, cameras that we can use for search and surveillance has really changed the way that we operate. We received our first uh, camera aircraft, at least for our department, I believe it was 2002 or three, and that was Valley Division's uh, 206. We received a 206 with a, uh, a Westcam uh, L3 MX-15 mounted on the uh, left wing. We got that plane in 2008. And that was a game changer for us as far as our capabilities. Uh, because basically at night in the airplane, we were kind of done because we didn't have the forward looking infrared capability that the helicopter had. So with the reception of this gift, uh, just a game changer. So we spend the bulk of our time helping allied agencies look for lost individuals. Uh, people have gone hiking got dark and now they don't know where they are. So we'll go locate them and help the ground crews get to them. If not coordinate with our helicopter, which can do night offsite landings and hover operations to retrieve people. So we work really closely with our, our rotor division at the office. Beyond that, it's uh, looking for bad guys. So you get a pursuit and that pursuit terminates in a neighborhood. The individuals in that car leave the car and run and hide. And if we're able to be overhead at that time, we can start letting the ground crews know where these individuals ended up. The other advantage is we can we can allow the ground crews to, you know, in these pursuits that get very high speed and get dangerous, we can say, okay, you guys back down. We'll watch the guy. And very often we'll follow them all the way to their home. They'll get out of their car. We'll ID them, you know, give a description. They'll go in their house and then the next thing you know, the house is surrounded and they're taking the guy into custody. So, and that's, that's a lot of what we do is that and it's the allied agencies that primarily get the bulk of our work just because they have the call volume and the highway patrol has call volume, but it's spread out over a wide area. And so if I would say, you know, 50% of the time we're doing highway patrol work and the other 50% we're doing allied agency work for the 350 agencies in the, in the greater Bay area. So it's a, it's a very interesting, very rewarding job. It's something I certainly enjoy. It, you know, kind of took, uh, it took me a while to figure out what my career path was going to be. And it sort of morphed into this from being a flight officer on a helicopter for seven years and finally taking my private pilot license that I got when I was 20 and going out, um, finishing up my commercial instrument when I was 40. <laughs> And actually putting it into play. So I've been um, I've been on the airplane side of the house for uh, going on nine years now. So it's quite a job we get to do here. Very very blessed and and happy to help the citizens of of California. It's, it's awesome. 
Well, I'm guessing there are some listeners right now who are thinking that it would be awesome if they could go fly for CHP as well. What what advice, if any, would you give to anyone who's thinking that they too would like to fly for CHP? Yeah. So, you know, my path to this job was kind of uh, along around the, the bend. It was not something that I thought I would get involved in. Being a paramedic was really not something I thought I was ever going to do. It just sort of, uh, I went from, you know, volunteer fire department to EMT school to, hey, this is pretty fun. Maybe I'll go to paramedic school and, and then doing that for a career and then realizing that I'd really like to have some sort of retirement and the, uh, you know, a government job is always a good place to go to look for that. And I started looking around and the highway patrol had paramedics on their helicopter. I'm like, well, that's pretty interesting. So I went from basically being, you know, a ground ambulance paramedic to being a CHP officer. Well, you know, one thing you have to keep in mind is that our job is law enforcement, you know, safety and service and security of the state. And in order to do that, you have to spend six months at our academy in West Sacramento and learn how to drive cars, um, shoot guns, write tickets, uh, write write crash reports, write arrest reports, you know, learn the ins and outs of uh, both the penal code and the vehicle code. And then um, you spend at minimum two years working at a road office. I was assigned to Hayward out of the academy. So I went to Hayward. You go through a break-in period there of about three months where you kind of learn learn the area, learn how to be an officer, learn officer safety and all the important things so that you get to go home every day in addition to helping people. And then uh, when you're put out on your own, you're, you're in charge of certain segments of roadway. So every, every place that you drive by on the highway, there's one or two officers that are assigned that particular stretch of roadway out of our office. So that becomes your responsibility should any incident occur. So if anybody's interested and just think it's, you know, an aviation gig, it's, it definitely starts out in the law enforcement realm first. So it's got to be something that you're really passionate about before you decide, oh, hey, it's cool to fly for law enforcement, but you got to know that you're getting into this as a law enforcement officer first. There are agencies that contract their pilots, so they're not sworn officers. They're, they're, function is strictly to operate the controls of the aircraft and and take the flight the flight officer where they would you know need to go to to handle the law enforcement or rescue calls so as long as people understand that part of it and and as far as the flying goes it is a combination of commercial flying and uh, general aviation flying so it's like kind of the best of both worlds in that respect not very often you get to do small fly a small airplane and land on two eight right at San Francisco to pick up anti botulism medicine at Signature Air to fly to Modesto to drop off so that ten people who got botulism can be cured. You know, so, you know these are some of the unique things that we end up doing. Um, we do donor flights. We do um, a, a number of strange things that you would not think would be part of the California Highway Patrol, but we just get pulled into them just because of our capabilities. But, you know, I, at 40 years old, I basically kind of did a career change. You know, I went from being a flight officer paramedic to being a pilot, and that's a big deal. And, you know, we, our, our training is very rigorous. It's very uh, military-based. We do, you know, three hours of quarterly training, an hour of instrument every three months, in addition to approaches and formation training, and we do emergency maneuvers training, which is upset training. So we learn how to handle the aircraft should we end up getting caught in wake turbulence or in a spin. Or um, So we do that training once a year, and we hold ourselves to a very high standard. So we operate under Part 91, but we kind of hold ourselves to a 135, 121 type standard as far as how tight our flying is. So that that part of it is what I really enjoy. It's very procedural. We have a lot of um, our own internal standard operating procedures that are more rigorous than the FARs. So yeah, it's a journey and I would recommend it to anybody that wants something out of the ordinary. There are so many interesting flying jobs out there, um, but this one lends itself to to quite a variety. And, you know, I work in one of the most beautiful places in the world. You know, the Bay Area is 
littered with landmarks and views that are bar none, some of the finest that you'll ever see in the world. And that's that's where my office resides, between 3,500 and 5,500 feet. <laughs> that's that's my view every day. So it's um, I'm super fortunate and very blessed to uh, to have this job. And there are always one or two openings statewide, as long as you're willing to uh, you know get your stuff done. What I would recommend is that you know, especially the younger group that might be listening to this, you know, get get your college degree because that right out of the gate, you're making 5% more than, than, than any other officer that graduates. So that, that degree is a big deal. Then get your ratings either before or when you get on the job, when you actually have some earning potential. And then, you know, our requirements, you know, your commercial instruments. So it's not, it's not that hard to attain. And uh, you just, you, you end up, you know, you get on a, a testing list and you come up and you fly with our chief pilot and that that puts you on the list for openings that you can apply for statewide. So as you're working as a road officer, you um, it's kind of like applying for a whole separate job, even though you're working for the same place. So I obviously couldn't recommend it more. And we have a, um, a very um, skilled group of aviators that work um, for us and around us. And that's what keeps this keeps this wheel going and provides the safety and service that we're able to uh, to give to the state. Jan, it's really easy to hear that you're very passionate about your job. Is there anything else you'd like to share with listeners uh, about what you're doing? You know, what I would appreciate everybody do is support your law enforcement, support your fire departments, especially in this time when you when you see really the value that that's expressed. I mean, they do they do this work on a daily basis, but when it, when it hits national media, it really um, kind of brings to head just how important these services are to all of the cities and counties throughout the nation. So just support those people and, and donate to these, to the people who lost everything in these fires. I mean, there are so many stories of tragedy and loss, and there are many places set up to receive you know, monetary donations or donations of clothing. And, you know, there's still thousands of people that are homeless at this point. And any donation toward those folks would be just awesome to help them get back on their feet. Yeah, that's uh, that's about all I've got. And thanks so much for having me on. Let me kind of relay this story to the rest of the world. Well, you tell a story remarkably well, and it's it's an incredibly important story. I, I can tell you that as a resident of the San Francisco Bay Area, I'm incredibly grateful for the, the, the work that you and your fellow officers and firefighters have been doing this week. Where can people go if they want to find out more about CHP and its air operations? Sure. Um, the first hub to look at would be our, our you know, state website, which is uh, chp.ca.gov. And then uh, we do have a Golden Gate Division Air Operations has a Facebook page. So just a, a Golden Gate Division Air Operations, um, CHP, yeah, you just Google that and our Facebook page will come up. And there's a number of you know, the uh, the helicopter crews have been interviewed by a number of national news uh, outlets. Uh, LA Times did a nice story on us that was recently published um, for this event that kind of is a timeline of the first 24 hours. So those are some some great places to get some information about what's currently going on. And, you know, we attend a lot of air shows. So anytime we're there, just please come up and talk to us. We, all of us, all of us who have gotten into air ops with the California Highway Patrol are really passionate, not only about law enforcement and helping people, but about aviation and love, you know, obviously <laughs> to talk about it. So happy to, um, to share that stuff. So don't be shy. Come up, ask us any questions you like. Part of what I like to do is inspire others, and uh, through through you know that kind of communication and those core sort of things, I'm hoping that the younger generation kind of looks at this and goes, "Hey, this is something I might want to do," so that we can carry out the tradition uh, that we have up here of providing safety, service, and security for the state of California. Well, you've inspired me, and I wish I could join, but I know I'm too old. Tell folks uh, what the <laughs> age cutoff is so that uh, they know that. Yeah, so it's uh, 20 and a half to age 35 is the 35 is the age cutoff. So 
before your 35th birthday, put in an application. I came on really late. I was, you know, I 31 when I applied, 33 when I graduated the academy. So it can happen later in life. It's totally fine. In fact, we we encourage people to have some sort of life experience before coming on the department. You know, that way you kind of bring a little bit to the table as far as seen or done other things uh, in the past. So, yeah, that's uh, that's the age cutoff. The the application process is is uh, fairly streamlined. It's all online, and then there's a, a written test you're required to take, and then you get into a background, um, a psychological background, a medical background, and just a a life background where they'll you know talk to friends, neighbors, and the grocery store owners that you visit, <laughs> whomever you know to kind of get an idea of who you are um, before we decide to hire you. So. The academy runs, we run uh, two to three classes simultaneously with about 200 officers in each class. And we're at this point barely able to keep up with attrition with retirements. So yeah, please, please look into applying. That's something you've thought about. It's a, it's a great career and lots to be offered uh, to you as an officer. And obviously there's the promotional route that I haven't even mentioned, you know, Sergeant, Lieutenant, Captain, Chief. And there's so many different jobs you can do. You know, if you get tired of flying, which I doubt anybody would, but, you know, you can ride a horse, you can ride a bicycle, you can, you know, drive a car, drive a motorcycle. We have guys that work commercial operations um, statewide in the scales. We have investigative officers that work undercover. We have a a task force that's dedicated strictly to um, cargo interdiction, like at large ports like L.A., Long Beach, and Oakland. So there's a lot of variety. We work with the FBI, work with DOJ, all of the other local, state, county, and um, city uh, law enforcement agencies to make uh, this world a safer place for the citizens of California. Jan, you have uh, totally sold me, and I hope people uh, don't get upset if I lie about my age when I apply, because it really sounds like (laughs) a really fun thing to do. Hey, thanks so much for helping keep us safe here in California and for talking with us here on Aviation News Talk podcast today. You're welcome, Max. And hey, you know, thank you for what you do. I really enjoy your podcast in addition to the other podcasts that you are on. And, you know, I, anything that inspires folks to to learn about, get involved with, dig more deeper into aviation is something I can nothing but give two thumbs up for. So, and I know that I know there's not a ton of money in the podcast industry. So thanks. Thanks for your time, because I I listen to a lot of podcasts and one and yours is one of my favorites. So um, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. And then we're happy to happy to have come on. The guys at the office will be thrilled. And I know that my partner, Todd, was really happy that we were going to get to kind of tell our story from that night. So happy to share it and hope everybody uh, hope everybody gets uh, something from it. Yep. And I, I've got to tell you, I was so shocked when I got an email back from a CHP saying that you listen to the show. So I thought this is perfect. So <laughs> it's a very synchronous. Uh, you you listen and now we've got you on the show and uh, we've got some new friends as well here. So that's great. Absolutely. Absolutely, Max. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. Have an awesome day out there and we'll talk soon. Okay. You do the same, Max. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Wow, what an inspiring story. We are just so lucky to have the men and women that are serving us here, both as uh, police officers as well as firefighters, helping us out in what has become the worst disaster here in California state history. By the way, after Jan and I talked today, I heard a story on KCBS, which is our local all-news radio station in San Francisco, and I wanted to share it with you. The reporter was interviewing a resident of Sonoma, which is up in the fire area, and that resident said that earlier he was sitting on his front porch and waving and calling out thank you to the police cars as they drove by. Now, you might not know this, but police departments from all over the state of California have been sending officers to help during the wildfires. So most of the police cars that were passing by were from other cities and towns. And the resident told the reporter that after calling out a thank you to one police car, that car turned around, came back, and officers got out to talk with the resident. And this is what one officer said to him. He said, thank you for thanking us. In our town, nobody thanks us. It makes you think, doesn't it? 
Anyway, separately, I wanted to assure you that the family that I referred to in the middle of the interview with Jan did all finally get out safely. It was a family of five, but the father had to stay behind while the rest of his family was flown to safety. And when the helicopter crew returned to pick him up, they couldn't find him on that first trip back, so they had to leave. But they did come back yet another time, found the father, and put him in the CHP helicopter. You can find a link to that story, which ran on the CBS Evening News, in our show notes, which you can get to by tapping the artwork on your podcast player. There, you can also find links to several things, including the CHP Golden Gate Division Air Operations Facebook page, and to the LA Times article that Jan referred to titled, Understaffed and Overwhelmed, Rescuers Had to Make Life and Death Choices as Wildfires Rage. You can also find links to all of these stories on our Patreon page. And speaking of Patreon, if you've been thinking, yes, I really like this Aviation News Talk podcast, and you've thought, yeah, maybe you'd like to support it, well, now's a great time to go out to the page and become a supporting member of the show by contributing as little as $2 a month by credit card. Just type into your web browser, aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, or go to aviationnewstalk.com and click on support the show in the upper left corner. And then either click on blog where you can read some of the free posts I've put up there, or in the right column, choose a monthly level of support that you'd like to contribute, click on it, and enter your information to sign up as a supporting member. Thanks very much. And as you know by now, I specialize in the Cirrus SR20 and SR22 and work with people around the country to help them acquire and get trained when they buy an airplane. And if you think you might want to buy a new Cirrus, please contact me now as I can help arrange a free demo flight for you in a new airplane. Until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. 